Thank you, Ranjan. And I also want to say thanks uh, to the administration of the College of Public Health for hiring a guy like me. Uh, when I was at a teaching workshop, well, not just like, you know, a loud hillbilly, but <laughs> somebody who's interested in the scholarship of teaching and learning. Uh, I was at a workshop this summer on the scholarship of teaching and learning, and I was telling people that I had been hired on a full-time tenure track to focus on excellence in teaching and improving classroom, the classroom experience for students. And needless to say, I left a lot of very jealous people in St. Louis um, when I came home here. So this opportunity to have this position is pretty unique in the national field. So I really appreciate that. Okay, I'm starting a timer so I don't go too long. So today, what I wanna talk about are some strategies that one can use to incorporate active learning into coursework. But I also want to reiterate what Ranjan said at the beginning. We are all educators. Regardless of whether you stand in front of a class or not, especially as public health experts, we are all educators. Everyone from the professor in the classroom to the educator in the field to the administrative staff who have to train other staff members or teach knuckleheads like me how to use the Scantron form, the Scantron machine. We're all educating others. So what I concentrate on are methods to incorporate active learning into the classroom experience. So first, I guess we should ask ourselves, what is active learning? So what I would like you to do is um, swallow what you're chewing, because I'm about to ruin it. No, think for just a second about what you, what you think when you hear the word, when you hear active learning, when someone says active learning, and I'm going to point this like that, fantastic. So if you've never heard of it before, what does it make you think? If you have heard of it before, what have you heard? And then I'm going to make you tell me. That's why I asked you to finish chewing. Yes, sir. Activities. Activities. Okay, so they're actually doing activities. Anything else? Are you guys going to be as bad as my freshman A&P students? Yeah, they're applying what they're learning. Okay, there's application involved. They're going to apply what they're learning. Thank you. Yes, sir? They're learning. They're actively learning. They're actually engaged in learning while they're in the classroom. Very good. Yes, sir? Contributing. They're contributing. So they're not only actively engaged, but they're contributing to their own education. Wonderful. So now let's look at actually some of the words the experts use. What I did was looked at the definition of active learning from Greenwood's dictionary, and I pulled out the key terms or phrases. What are the hallmarks of an active learning environment? So one of those is, of course, engagement. You talked about that they're doing activities. They're engaged. They're not passive, right? This is the opposite of passive learning. This is active learning. The students are engaged in taking ownership of their own learning. But there are some other key features that I think are less obvious. For example, in an active learning environment, the students are engaged in gathering information. No more are they a passive receptacle that we fill up with knowledge, but the student is tasked with seeking the information they need to accomplish the learning that they're being asked to do that very day. This is a big one. An active learning classroom involves thinking and reflection. We all want our students to think and reflect on the things we're teaching them. We all hope that they go home and rub their chins and think deeply about what they spent their time in class doing that day. But I would posit that using active learning, one can have them doing the thinking and reflection in the classroom while you're there to guide them in their thinking and reflection. Additionally, Students are engaged in problem solving. So again, no more are they being shown how to solve problems, but they're getting their hands dirty. They're getting their feet wet. They're jumping in there and working often together to solve problems on their own with the teacher, with the instructor, there for guidance. So we're not just handing them and saying, here, here's how you solve this problem. We're saying, here, solve this problem. I will help you. It's a, it's a minor difference, but it's a very important difference. And then finally, the thing that everybody worries about when they learn about active learning is, how am I going to cover everything? 
but in an active learning environment, students get their content through participation. I'm teaching clinical parasitology this semester. Um, I'm going to talk about that more in a little while, but in my clinical parasitology class, we have met 10 times now. We met for the 10th time yesterday. It's a Tuesday, Thursday class, so lectures an hour and a half. So it means we've had 15 hours of course instruction time. I have spent maybe 40 minutes standing in front of them doing what I'm doing now. The rest of the time, they've been working on case studies, actively engaged in thinking, reflecting, and solving problems based on actual patient data. So they had a test yesterday, or they had a test on Tuesday. And one of the students remarked to me uh, after the exam, she was like, you know, Dr. Brown, it's amazing. I couldn't believe how much I actually knew. Here we were just working on these little, on these little activities in class, but I learned so much. So it's not that you sacrifice content, it's that the content is delivered by the student's participation in it. Donald Semanek is a uh, thinker on teaching and learning, a science educator, and an hilarious debunker of pseudoscience and, and other assorted garbage. Um, but I love this particular quotation from him. And I think regardless of whether you use active learning or not, whether you're interested in using active learning or not, we could all agree that no method of teaching, no method of learning works unless your students work. Now by and large, we are expecting that work to occur outside of the classroom. The only difference here is that I'm going to suggest that there are ways that one can put them to work in the classroom and achieve as good as or better results from them. Okay, so that's what active learning is. Now what I want to do is give you some concrete examples. This is by no means going to be an exhaustive list. I'm just going to give you little bitty examples of specific ways that active learning can be integrated into a classroom environment. But keep in mind, learning isn't always in a classroom. We'll get back to that. Okay. Active learning is going to appear along a spectrum. What uh, I shamelessly stole this slide. Um, there's going to be a spectrum of both risk and engagement. And what I mean with risk is something unfamiliar, something that might not work as well as what we've been doing. And then, of course, we all know what engagement is. So what I'm going to do is start down here at this end, low risk, in, low risk classroom activities that are also generally on the low end of the engagement scale and work our way up to the very high engagement end, but also things that are rather high risk, things that take us way outside of our comfort zone as educators. So, of course, the lowest risk thing that we can do is lecturing. That's how we learned, right? I would imagine, I did, um, this is how I learned everything I learned in high school and college and on into graduate school until I actually started learning by doing. Um, it's very low risk, but I'm lecturing. What are you guys doing? You're eating. Sometimes when you're lecturing, what are your students doing? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Updating their Facebook status, uh, playing Angry Birds, uh, oftentimes anything but actually engaging in what it is you want them to learn. So. Lecturing is tried and true, but it is, of course, a lower engagement. It's much easier to be passive and to sit back. Um, if we move up the scale one, we can go into Socratic teaching. That's low risk. I've already done that once. Didn't I ask you guys what you thought of active learning? Yeah, and I polled you. Now, that's fairly easy to do in a room with, what do we got, 40 people in here, maybe? Okay, what about when you have 110 or 250 or 500? It can still be done, it just requires a little bit of tweaking. You've all probably seen or heard of clickers, right? Audience response systems. Well, what if you don't have clickers? What do all of your students have in their pocket? What do they all have? Actually, if it's female students, it's usually in their back pocket, and then they sit on it and break it. They have a cell phone in their pocket. There's a website called Poll Everywhere, which I forgot to put on your handout, uh, that actually allows you to use cell phones as audience response systems. Okay, what if you don't want them having their cell phones out? Guess what? Everybody comes with a clicker on the end of your arm, right? 
one, two, three, four, five. You can have five options, they can have five responses. This is a, a technique I use a lot in teaching workshops uh, when I go in the summertime to help other people. There are other low-tech methods of getting feedback from the students. But by me asking a question and then stopping, what do you have to do? You have to think, you have to reflect on what it is we've been talking about. You have to take a break from listening and switch modes from passive, receptive, to active, to engaged, to thinking and reflecting about what it is we're talking about. Okay, let's move up the scale a little bit. Who, has anybody ever heard of a minute paper? I see some nods, some hands. Okay, a lot of you know what this is. For those of you that don't, you just tell your students you have one minute to complete X task, to do this job. Um, a frequent use of minute papers is to say, what's the big idea? I've been up here talking for 10 minutes and 13 seconds now. So I could ask you, all right, take one minute to quickly write down, I'm not going to do it right now, but I could ask you to take a minute and write down what's the main theme that Dr. Brown's talked about this morning. Another common use of minute papers is to ask your students, what don't you get? What's confusing? What is, it's called a stumbling block paper. What is your biggest stumbling block? What has confused you from what we've talked about so far this morning? So again, you're forcing your students to stop being passive and to engage, to think and reflect about what they have and have not learned. Additionally, the great thing about minute papers is it lets you come around and look or take them up and get an idea. You can glance very quickly through these and see, are they getting the big idea or aren't they? Are they all stumbling over the same little piece of content? Did I phrase something wrong? Was that slide too busy? Was the information too difficult to extract? And you can get that feedback, that immediate feedback, to let you know how your teaching and their learning is going. So far, none of the things I've talked about take very long out of a class, a minute. You know, maybe two if you walk around and look while they're doing it. But now we're starting to move up into the risk category, right? And one of the risks on my little scale here is not covering everything, right? Not being able to tell them everything you want to tell them. So with short collaborative learning strategies, and the list is long of these, you're going to have to take a bigger chunk out of your class time. But the rewards of being active in gathering information, thinking, reflecting, and problem solving can make those five minutes or those ten minutes that you take out of the classroom very beneficial. So what I'm going to do is give you a couple of examples of short collaborative learning techniques. This is by no means an exhaustive list. If you'll look on your handout under the um, that first link, the CERC, Science Education Research Center, um, they have a wonderful list of various active learning techniques, um, including some of these short collaborative methods. All right, so first thing I want you to do is I'm going to issue you a challenge. Your challenge is, without talking to anybody else, I want you to think quietly of one impediment to bringing active learning into your job even if you're not a classroom instructor, if you're a public health educator, um, if you're an administrative aide, whatever it is you do, what would prevent you from engaging the people that you're teaching more as they're learning? Think about it. And that's what 30 seconds feels like. <laughs> right, I just took 30 seconds, that's all. All right, now what I want you to do is turn to the person or persons near you um, and share. All right, take 60 seconds, take a minute, and just talk. What is your big impediment? What could prevent you from doing this sort of thing? It could be you don't want to.
If you can hear the sound of my voice, please clap two times. If you can hear the sound of my voice, please clap three times. Clap four times, please. Clap twice. Okay. If you have a room of 110 bobbling freshmen, that's a wonderful way to get their attention back on you and away from each other. Okay, so would anyone volunteer to share uh, what they came up with? What was your impediment? Yes, sir. Uh, getting attention. I mean, most, most of the time, at least when I try to teach you, they don't either forget engagement. I don't think they're even there. <laughs> okay, so actually getting them present in the classroom. How can I actually get them to not think about the SIG EP semi-formal? Right, okay, very good. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Uh, fear driven by lack of self-confidence about how to do this. Fear, we will talk about that more later. That is a big impediment to this because, um, yeah, it's scary. Yes, sir, Dr. Wyckoff. <laughs> very good. How do you do this in a tiered lecture hall? Great. Anybody else have anything? Yes, ma'am. Sensitive or controversial topic. Okay, so are you covering something that's maybe sensitive or controversial? And if the students are actually putting their heads together and talking about it, maybe um, fisticuffs will erupt or at least um, more vociferous arguments. Very good. Yes, sir. Class management. Class management. How do you keep them on time, on task, and how do you get their attention back when it's time to come back together as a class? I'd like the clappy thing, but that's just me because, again, I'm a loud hillbilly. Okay, so who can tell me what you just did? What was that little activity called? That was called a think, pair, share. I took four minutes out of my time I have with you to have you engaged in what I'm trying to teach you. So I had you think first for 30 seconds. Did that seem like an eternity? That was a long, uncomfortable 30 seconds, wasn't it? You would be surprised how even the most reticent student will, after 30 seconds of silence, finally flip out and be like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Nobody's going to answer, so I will. So 30 seconds seems like a long time, and that's because it is. When you're, you're no longer sitting back, you're not texting, right? You're thinking. All right, now, then you paired. So I had you discuss, I introduced collaboration. So not only are you thinking and reflecting internally, but now you're thinking and reflecting externally, verbally with one another. And then of course we brought it back to share with the rest of the classroom. And that can spark discussion. It can be used to segue into the next piece of material, um, or it can be used to deepen our understanding. And that's one of the things I love about these various pedagogies, um, these various techniques is they allow you to drill down into the material a little bit more. You're encouraging, or in some cases forcing, uh, deeper thinking about the content. Okay, I'm going to show you an example of one more. We don't have time to actually do it, um, so we will do one more challenge and I'll just show you how it works. A lot of what we do, right, especially as we are moving forward, is we're trying to get students, and I, you guys are going to cringe when I say this word, to see the big picture. Right? That doesn't mean the gist. I tell my nursing students those are two very different things. The big picture and the gist are not the same thing. What you want to learn is the gist. What I'm going to ensure is that you learn the big picture. But seeing how the various minor aspects, how the various particulars of what it is we're trying to teach people to do, to see how those fit together into the big picture of what they are going to be doing as professionals. Or if you're training the public as a public health educator, you know, helping them see how this one thing that I'm trying to get you to do fits into the larger picture of personal and community health. So one way to do that is this way. So I could ask you, and I'm not going to, uh, but it seems like an appropriate subject given what's coming up in November. Look at these various concepts. What I would like for you to do is draw a diagram, a chart, a flow chart, a map, whatever. Draw some diagram that shows how these things are related to one another. And then after a suitable amount of time, I could ask you to trade with the person next to you and compare and see, are your drawings fundamentally the same or fundamentally different? So for example, mine might look like this, okay? Yours might be arranged circularly or it might be an indented list or something like that. But what we've just done is a little task called concept mapping. So you are making a graphical display of how concepts interact with one another. 
You could do this with Venn diagrams. There are lots of ways to do it. But you're taking time out of class and you're asking your students to not only think about but graphically articulate the big picture to integrate what it is we've learned today with what you knew before or what we've learned in the rest of the course or what you've learned in other coursework. So there are tons of little five minute, ten minute things that you can introduce into a traditional didactic course that will dramatically increase student engagement um, and their involvement with the course material. You'll get them thinking more deeply about what it is you want them to learn. All the way on the right hand side of our scale, high engagement but also very high risk is cooperative learning. This is where you now take a back seat if you're a classroom instructor, which is what I am. You no longer are the center of attention. The students become responsible for their own learning. In cooperative learning, the students are working in small groups, generally anywhere from three to seven, generally not much more than that. In cooperative learning classrooms, the teacher is stepping back. No longer are they the font of all knowledge. They are there as facilitator. They are there, well, Dr. Roan remains the font of all knowledge, but the rest of us have to step back from our, from our lofty perch. <laughs> right. So we act as facilitators. And we do this by having the students work on very carefully planned activities. You said activity? Okay. Activities, right. So now they have something in front of them. And these various cooperative learning strategies revolve around a learning cycle. Um, there are two that are very popular amongst my people, the teaching and learning nerds. Um, there's the three-way learning cycle um, that came out in the 1960s with Piaget and Karplus, um, and that's the, the EIA learning cycle, not E-I-E-I-O, that is something entirely different, E-I-A. Exploration, so the students are given data, a graph, um, an epidemiology map, you know, an outbreak map, if that's a real thing, I'm not an epidemiologist. Um, <laughs> But they're, giving, they're given some sort of data to explore. They ask, they're asked questions about what they see in front of them. And then in the next phase, a term is introduced or what's even cooler is they are tasked with inventing a concept. So for example, uh, yesterday in AMP2, we're learning about adaptive immunity. And I want, rather than me say, CD4 cells, CD4 positive T cells are called helper T cells because they secrete cytokines that orchestrate various downstream events of the immune response. All right, I could say that. Or I could show them what CD4 positive T cells do. I could ask, okay, what are, name the four things, the four classes of things that this type of cell might secrete. Right? And say, okay, what do all of those things have in common? And in the activity they're working on, the word signal is in there every single time. I'd say, okay, now, why do you suppose that CD4 positive T cells are also called helper T cells? So I didn't tell them why. They had to figure it out. They had to invent the concept of the helper T cell on their own. This type of learning cycle is revolving around a notion of constructivist learning. That is, how many of you, let's, let me ask this, how many of you are 35, almost 36-year-old white males from Clinton, Tennessee, who have a wife, two children, three dogs, and a PhD in cellular molecular biology? What? Just me? So if I try to take information out of my head, information that is framed in that framework, the framework of the 35-year-old hillbilly from Clinton with the wife and the kids and the dogs and the whatnot, and try to put it into the head of a 19-year-old um, female from Bombay, right? That's not going to work. Our backgrounds are different. The way we perceive the world is going to be different. So rather than me thinking I can take my information from my head and put it into hers, what if, what if I encourage her to construct that knowledge on her own within the framework of her own previous knowledge, her own perceptions, her own life history? And then the last bit is that you challenge them to apply that knowledge. I think the word application came up earlier. 
So there's an application phase where after the concept has been invented there or the term has been introduced, they are tasked with applying that often in a real world situation. That's that problem solving bit coming in. Um, there's another learning cycle called the 5E. So in addition to those three stages, they add engagement at the beginning and evaluation throughout. But the idea is the same. It's cyclic. The students explore, they invent, they apply, they're evaluated, and then they start over again. There are lots of different ways to do this, and they all have fancy little names or acronyms. There is a set called PX to the NL. That seems like P, O G I, L, Pogel, P, B, L, problem based learning, P, L, T, L, problem led or peer led team learning. There are other things like case based learning, which I use. Um, studio classrooms, team-based learning, scientific teaching method, workshop biology, the list goes on and on and on. If you would like to see an exhaustive list, the CERC website has one of the various methodologies. Um, these are scary. You know, we talked about the fear factor. No longer are you the sage on the stage. You know, you have to step back. And I think the biggest fear there, and we talked about this as well, is you're going to lose control of your classroom, right? But I would posit that you can have these games. You can have these stages with the students in control, the students responsible for their own learning without giving up total control of the classroom. Uh, we don't have speakers, so um, you won't be able to hear this, but that's okay because I would have turned the volume down anyway. Um, assuming it actually loads. If it doesn't, we'll just move on. But I want to show you a video of what one of these classrooms looks like. So this is a Pogel classroom, process-oriented guided inquiry learning. Um, this is at a high school, but this is a method that was actually developed to teach high school chemistry or to teach uh, college chemistry. And what you will see is the students are given their activities. They're going to begin the day with a mini quiz. So we're going to assess what they learned from last time. This is going to let the instructor know whether or not they got it. Does she need to intervene right then and there to address some sort of misconception? So the students are reporting out on their mini quiz. They're doing it orally in this case. Sometimes they report out in writing. Okay, and you can see she's getting their attention back on her. She's using the quiet coyote. So rather than the clappy thing, which I like because it's loud and obnoxious, she's just raising her hand but that's going to get the attention back on her. And now what she's doing is this is their model. This is the data that they're going to explore in the exploration phase of their learning cycle. And she's telling them first, before you do anything else, take two minutes and just read the table. Figure out what's actually in that table. What data are present for you to work with. Then I want you to work through a series of problems and at 1031 you're going to be done with that, we're going to come back together, and you're going to report out on what you've learned. And then look at this. Every day, this warms my heart more than anything else as a classroom teacher, is seeing the kids, kids, good Lord, some of them are older than me, but seeing the students with their heads together, not just discussing, but in some, time, some cases, you know, arguing a little bit. I've seen students arguing about photosynthesis. Can you imagine being so engaged that you argue over the electron transport chain of Photosystem 1? Really? Yeah. So you see the students and then now they're reporting out and she's seeking consensus. So if she says, okay, what'd you get for question three? Did you get anything different? Do you agree? Did you get anything different? Do you agree? If they all agree and they all got the right answer, we move on. They've learned it. So she knows they learned it and now we can move on. Okay. So. That's an active learning classroom. So what are some of the pros? Right, I've got some pros here. Pros to these cooperative learning strategies, in some cases older pros. Obviously there's going to be more engagement. You saw in that picture the students with their heads together. I'm going to show you pictures from my classroom here at ETSU in a tiered lecture hall with 110 students crammed in cheek to jowl doing the exact same thing. Engaged in learning. You're going to get better comprehension. Back to my case-based parasitology class. One of the students told me, 
after the exam, she came by my office and uh, wanted to go over her exam. And uh, she made an A, by the way. And she was saying, you know, the thing that surprised me the most was when I sat down to study, I realized I already knew all this stuff. I wasn't memorizing stuff for the first time. I already knew it. I was just kind of reminding myself or filling in the blanks, you know, stuff that I may have just missed the first time through. But I really didn't have to study all that much. And it was a massive amount of information, right? Every protozoan parasite, that was their exam, was all protozoan parasites. Well, not all of them, but uh, 17 or 18 of them, uh, the big ones. So massive amounts of content comprehended the first time through. Additionally, one of the other nice benefits is this higher order learning. They're not just learning superficially. They're not just learning facts, but because of the constant thinking, reflection, and then assessment that they're going to get from me and their classmates, we're going to be moving on up that pyramid of thinking and learning. We're going to move on up into those areas of problem solving, critical thinking, and application. Additionally, they're going to get more than just content. My students aren't just learning the facts. I like to say one of the great things about my job is I don't get to teach them just about anatomy and physiology. I get to teach them college. Right? They learn written and oral communication skills, interpersonal communication, time management, human resource management, because somebody's got to be in charge of that small group and making sure everybody stays on task and gets finished on time. Right? Wonderful skills that we all want our students to learn, and these give us an opportunity to incorporate that into our time in the classroom. And then, of course, there's a lot less napping when you're beholden to the people around you and you have some job to perform in that group. Now, as with anything, if there's a list of pros, there's going to have to be some cons. So you're going to see longer, those are cons, you're going to see longer prep time. I can prepare a lecture in a couple hours. It takes a day and a half to prepare a process-oriented guided inquiry learning activity for a 50-minute class. It takes a lot of time to prepare these, especially the first time around. Um, you can get some student rebellion. We all learned from lecture. Guess what? So have they. A lot of them like it. They don't like it when you start doing weird things in the classroom. Trust me, I've been there. I do lots of weird things in the classroom. And there are some students who don't like it, and that is something you're going to have to deal with. It's not going to be many, but trust me, the ones who don't like it will let you know. We already discussed lower instructor comfort level. This is different. This is weird. This isn't what we're used to. This isn't how we learned. And it's not going to be as effective if you don't buy it. Right? That's one of the things. There was a great paper that came out in CBE Life Sciences Education last month. And it was talking about how if someone is just given one of these active learning pedagogies and said, here, go do this, or if they just pick it off the shelf and try to go do it, but they don't actually bother to, or they're not instructed in the theory behind it and the constructivist mindset behind how the activities were put together, they're no more effective than a didactic classroom. Fortunately, they're not any less effective, but the fact remains, it's a whole lot of extra work for no benefit if you're not engaged in the underlying theory behind it. I was debating whether or not to leave that last point in there. Because when I used to talk about this in the past, I would say like, yeah, you know, with A&P, I had to cut about 20% of the stuff out in order to get them thinking deeply about the 80% of the stuff I left in. You know, so yeah, I sacrificed some content, but they're thinking more deeply, right? It's not as broad, but it's deeper. But then I realized, just because I don't stand up there and say it, doesn't mean I can't hold them responsible for knowing it. There are these wonderful things called books, and they have knowledge. And you can ask them to read these books and get the knowledge out. And as long as you're explicit and you say, look, you have to know this thing. You have to be able to perform this task. You have to be able to define these words. There's no reason you have to cover it in class. Heavens to mercy. There's the interwebs. There's all kinds of stuff out there to help them. So the fact is, in a and I actually cover more now than I did when I was doing it just in lecture. So you might have to cut some content, but you might not either. One of the greatest things about these various active learning strategies is that assessment is built into them. 
so many, so often, and you know, this was the case with me for a very long time. Um, you come out of the classroom feeling like a rock star. You know, the other day I was telling, uh, I was telling Stacy, my wife, um, what a great day I had because we were learning about CD8 T cells and they're cytotoxic and I compared viral infection with the zombie apocalypse and you know the students were thinking about well if one zombie bites you now you're gonna become a zombie and then in the very end I played a 15 second clip from zombie land and then you know so we weren't learned rule number two pap, pap, double tap it was a great day but it was hilarious by the way but had I not also been doing the act of learning I would have had no idea if they'd actually gotten it. They were entertained. They were laughing. I was bouncing around up on the stage like a lunatic. So they were having a good time, but I wouldn't have known if they had learned anything if I had not already looked over the shoulder of two dozen individual students to see if they were getting the right answers. So all too often, it's easy for us to say, oh, I've had such a great day teaching, but we never check to see if they learned anything until exam time, right? We do assess. But the nice thing about these active learning strategies is they allow us to assess as we go along. And when problems come up, they allow us to evaluate what we're doing and change it then and there. All right. That was a 40 minute introduction to the 10 minutes of what I actually do. <laughs> okay, so what I'm gonna show you are some of the things I've done, am doing, and hope to do um, by way of incorporating active learning into the health sciences. So we'll start out in the past. Uh, a year and a half ago, a paper came out in Advances in Physiology Education. Um, you can see I was not here at that time. I was still at King College. But the paper dealt with my introduction of the process-oriented guided inquiry learning method, POGL, into my intro AMP2 class at King. Spring of 08 was the last year I taught AMP2 solely with lecture. So 42 class meetings, every single one was a 60 minute lecture. And you can see that their average on their cumulative final exam was a D plus. So by the end of the semester, they'd managed to hold on to, on average, two thirds of the stuff I wanted them to know. Uh, in the summer of 2008, I went to a three day POGO workshop, drank the Kool-Aid, came home and immediately wrote 17 60-minute POGOL activities and introduced them the very next semester. And as you can see, on the exact same final exam, the integrity of which I am very confident, the average rose up to a B minus, crept up into a steady solid B, and remained there, even after I started switching the exam questions around and stuff. So the comprehension was much greater after the introduction of the active learning method. And this was not every class day. Once or twice a week we did this. But even more important, and I think even um, more exciting to me, was what happened to my DF rate. Before I introduced POGL, anywhere from 16 to up to 20 plus percent of the students in the course earned a D or an F. This at King College, like here at ETSU, is a preclinical course. You have to make either a C or a C plus, depending on which clinical program you want to go into, in order to progress. So I was, not I was, we were together, me and the students together, were letting down up to a fifth of my students, right? One, fully one fifth of my students were unable to progress on into their careers um, because they weren't able to make satisfactory progress in AMP2. After the introduction of the POGL method, that number dropped to 6%. In the fall of 2009, this was an exceptional class. Um, no one made below a C, not even a C minus. I think the lowest grade that semester was a 74. Um, and after that, during the time I was at King College, it stayed around 6%. So a drastic reduction in the students who had to repeat the course or who had to change majors and were not able to go forward in their clinical path. And I didn't make the course easier. As a matter of fact, it got harder. Every semester, the class got harder. I expected more of them. The in-semester tests got more and more difficult. Less recall questions, more critical thinking and problem solving questions on the exam. And despite the increase in rigor, the DF rate stayed right there around the 6% mark. So that's where I was. These are some of the slides I showed 
when I came here and interviewed last year in March. So I came to ETSU in August of this year. So what am I doing now? Well, I don't just teach AMP2 now. I teach AMP1 as well. So I've written more POGL activities. So right now the student workbook is up to 40 activities. So that's 40 class periods over the entire AMP 1 and 2 curriculum, if you take me for both, that there's no lecture, you're doing the active learning in small groups with other classmates. Uh, I have these activities out being beta tested right now, getting them ready hopefully for publication um, in 20 different schools in the U.S., as well as a guy in South Africa, a woman in Australia, and of all places a woman at a nursing school on the Isle of Man uh, are using these activities and this is just because they're the ones who found out about them through the paper and advances in phys ed. And you see these kids right down here? See these guys? That's at ETSU. That's Brown 261. Tiered lecture hall. But they've got their heads together and they're sitting in there arguing about, I think, osteogenesis. All right? We're making bones. So it is possible. It's by no means easy. Would it be easier to do it in here where I could have everybody at a table of four? Oh, yeah, you betcha. Um, but it is doable in these larger uh, tiered lecture halls. All right, I've also developed a case-based parasitology class. So the way this works is, and this is one I told you I've spent a whopping 40 minutes so far, the whole semester, talking at them. The way this works is the students come in with one or two case studies. So they're given a case presentation, looks something like this, and they have data on a patient. And then I ask them questions like, okay, write down the significant signs and symptoms being exhibited by this patient. Super. They can explore the data to pick out the signs and symptoms. Um, and then I might ask them, is there anything unusual in the patient's travel history, diet, um, sexual habits, anything like that that can transmit disease? Right? We'll pick one of those. And then they'll write that down. And then I'll have them examine more deeply the labs maybe, or imaging, whatever information I've given them, and I'll ask them for a diagnosis and treatment. So far, that's pretty straightforward. But here's where the fun part comes. Then I can say, okay, here's the life cycle of this organism. I'll give them a handout. Based on what you see in this life cycle, are there any personal protective measures one can take to prevent transmission of this particular parasite? And then this is the part that's going to warm your heart. I say, based on this life cycle, are there any public health measures that could be taken to reduce the incidence and prevalence of this particular parasite? Now the questions are going to vary. That's just kind of an example. Um, but that's what they're doing. So, and I want to point out to you the very clever name for this. This guy had black water fever. Thank you. Thank you for getting that. <laughs> they didn't get it. None of the students got it. And I also want to show you that here they are. So they have their phones out. They have laptops out, but they don't have time to text because they're too busy looking up what Winterbottom sign is or what is Romagna's sign and how is that affected to, or how is that related to T. Cruzy infection. So, yeah, they've got the technology out, but now we're putting it to use, right? We're using our powers for good and not evil. And that's important. So, um, thanks for getting that. <laughs> All right. And then finally, the last thing that I've got going on currently, right now in my lab, which I don't have one of those, um, is development of hypothesis-driven physiology labs. You know, so often A&P lab is look at this, name this thing, look at this, name this thing, and that's important. You need to be able to kind of know the bones, especially if you want to go on and be an orthopedist. Um, so it's important to know the parts. But at the same time, I want these students to start thinking like scientists. I want, to think, I want them to think about how do we solve problems through experimentation. So using almost all of this year's startup funds that Dr. Chakraborty was able to procure for somebody in a teaching track. Hello, that's awesome. We don't usually get startup funds, so that was awesome. I bought six handheld um, instruments called a veneer lab quest and an EKG for that interface. And what you're looking at right here are ETSU. That one is uh, dental hygiene, pre-PT, nursing, 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 pre-dental hygiene. These are our students. And they brainstormed things that might affect one's EKG. They picked four of those things that we could test in the classroom. They formed hypotheses and then they all took baseline EKGs. We did the experiments. We collated our data. 
So they're taking means and percent differences between the baseline and the experimental. Am I turning them into scientists? No. But are they starting to see what it is that scientists do? Are they starting to think like professionals? I hope so. So I'm going to uh, try to get some more money um, to do this. I'm going to try to get some NSF money so that I can get some people to help me and maybe create a series of these labs. All right, um, I am almost out of time, so let's talk about what I hope to do in the future. My letter from IRB came yesterday to do this. I'm very excited. Adult or non-traditional learners are becoming more and more prevalent in our classrooms, especially with the economy the way it is now. There are more and more people who are seeking training for a second career, people who have been out of the workplace for a long time, having families, and are now returning for their training to go back into the workplace. At the same time, concomitantly, that was redundant, um, at the same time, there, you're seeing greater inclusion of these active learning techniques across curricula. Chemistry and physics have been doing this stuff for a very long time. Medicine has been using case-based learning um, from time immemorial. And they're becoming more prevalent across disciplines. So the question is, these two things are happening at the same time. Is there a perception between your non-traditional student and your 18 to 22 year old with the, with the popped collar straight out of high school? Do they perceive these active learning strategies differently? Is it more or less difficult for a 43 year old mother of four to be in a group with a bunch of punk kids? Right? Nobody knows, we don't know. And do those perceptions mirror performance? Do the people who see active learning in a negative light actually perform worse on the content that was delivered with active learning. So all of the instruments are ready to test this. IRB letter came yesterday, so my letter to particip participants is going out on Monday. We're very excited about that. And then also, one thing I'm trying to get money to do uh, is use tablets in case-based learning. I showed you that case presentation, right, Mr. Azikiwe? Um, who had the Blackwater fever. I had to give them the pieces of data they needed to make the correct diagnosis. Gave it to them. Didn't have a choice. I had one sheet of paper. I can't print out a zillion copies or ask them to print out a zillion copies. But what if I had a digital back end? What if they had to request which blood tests? What if they had to request the spinal puncture or the imaging, the thick smear, the thin smear, the fecal smear, the O&P? So now they're not faced with, oh, here's all the pieces of the puzzle you need, but you need to go find the puzzle. So I'm wanting to create this digital back end. I'm going to have to hire somebody um, who can program with Android because not this guy. Um, I can do the content, but Android's a whole different beast and iOS, don't even think about it. So that's one of the things I'm interested in doing is using the technology that's becoming more and more prevalent in the students' bags, again, turning it toward good instead of evil. Less of the Facebook, more of the smart people books. Okay, so that's what I've done, what I'm doing, and what I hope to do. The last question I have is for you guys. <laughs> Are you interested in any of this? If yes, come see me. Um, would you be interested in using this in outreach efforts? I have a colleague named Rosalie Koenig at the University of Florida uh, who's in the College of Agriculture. And she is using the Pogel method to train ex to, uh, with extension agents. So the extension agents are taking these activities out into the field and having farmers work through them so that the farmers are understanding the toxicology of pesticide use. Farmers are understanding how evolution works so they get a better idea of breeding. So it's not just for classroom instruction. Um, would you like to see what one of these classrooms look like? Okay, it's all well, good, well and good in theory, but what does this actually look like in the classroom? You can come to my classroom. I happen to know a very talented pharmacy professor who also has a classroom that uses lots of active learning. And she has already told me that you are welcome to contact her if you, or me through, her through me um, if you would like to see what her classroom looks like. So anything I can do if you're interested, okay? And I'm not proselytizing. If you don't want to do this, you are not going to hurt my feelings in the least. But if you're interested and you feel like you might want to incorporate some of these things and don't know how or don't know where you can find the resources to help you do that, 
don't hesitate to call me. That's kind of why I was hired, um, is to be a resource, just like we all were, right? We were all hired not just to do our own thing, but to be a resource for our colleagues. So let me be a resource for you. All right, I have gone 11 seconds over, so I am very sorry, <laughs> um, but I thank you for your time. And if there are any questions, or you can, yes, sir. You sort of attribute this uptick in Fogel to a workshop you attended. Yes, sir. But you obviously didn't attend that randomly. What were, what were the factors that led you in that direction? Part A and Part B, is that the right direction for others who are interested in pursuing that approach? Okay. So part A of Dean Wyckoff's question was, how did I find out about the Pogel workshop and get involved in it? Um, again, a very striking bioanalytical chemist um, with whom I happen to live went to a one-day Pogel workshop at an American Chemical Society meeting. Um, so they, the Pogel project and some of these other um, active learning projects will hold workshops at national meetings. Um, biology is woefully behind uh, chemistry and physics, especially in the basic, you know, kind of the big three basic sciences. Um, so I found out about it uh, through Stacy, uh, through my wife and uh, they hold periodic, at the time they were holding multiple workshops every summer. Now um, there's one per region every summer. So the next Pogel regional meeting and workshop will be on July the 25th through 28th it, at uh, Guilford College in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, they have some of the best on-campus, Aramark people back there, they have the best on-campus food I've ever eaten at Guilford, <laughs> so I'm just telling you. Um, in addition to the Pogel uh, workshops, there are national workshops. Uh, some of the websites I've given you links to um, will tell you where to find uh, these various workshops. Um, I'm going to try to bring the Pogel regional meeting here uh, in the next year or two. So hopefully we'll have either the big regional meeting or um, a private workshop here. I'm a nationally certified Pogel facilitator, so I can lead workshops. So. That is definitely on my plate to do. Um, other things, peer-led team learning, uh, team-based learning, other group learning techniques, um, there are people out there. The National Center for Case Study Teaching and Science in Buffalo, New York, has a week-long summer institute every summer. Um, so Pogel is great. Um, is it the be-all and end-all? No. There are, uh, you know, I don't use it every day. I'm doing case-based learning in my other classes. I, I, I use lots of stuff. Um, if you're doing chemistry, Pogel's great because there's already materials out there. You don't have to write them. Um, so Pogel is great because it incorporates the process skills, the, the critical thinking, the communication skills and whatnot. But there are other equally good um, active learning techniques out there that you can you know, evaluate and use based on what it is you're doing. Yes, sir? I'm curious of how um, anatomy, uh -huh. example, how would you use some of these active learning bases for basic vocabulary? Like an anatomy one type thing where you're introducing terms to people that don't even know that there's terms to know. That's good. So how do you do this with vocabulary? Um, the very first activity we do in AMP one, um, I have a list of Greek roots and their English translations. So they explore the table. I say, okay, what is the prefix for bone? Okay, what is the suffix to for make new? What is the prefix for, or the suffix for in the blood? And then I'll say further on down, okay, um, define septicemia. Okay, using the things in the table, how would you make up a word that means to make new bone? So one, I'm encouraging them to use the medical terminology to delve into the Latin and Greek etymology of these words so that when they're faced with unfamiliar words, they can more easily figure them out. And then at the end of the activity, there's a homework assignment. And I say, go define these words. Um, in the same activity, I have a picture of a statue of Zeus. And Zeus is labeled A, B, C, D, E, F, G, etc. Um, and then I say, okay, describe the relative positions of B and C. And they'll say things like above or over or on top of or something like that. And then I'll give them another picture, except I have a, a statue that's labeled with anterior posterior, superior, inferior, proximal, and distal. And I say, now go back and do the thing with Zeus again, but use these words. And so not only are they learning the definition of anterior, posterior, superior, inferior, etc., but they're seeing the utility of having the standardized vocabulary. Right? Why do I have to learn all these big, goofy words? Why can't I just say on top of? 
Well, what if they're laying on their back? What if they're upside down in a Jeep that's wrecked, right? On top of is different. So yes, it can be done. It's not easy, um, but it can be done. Yes, sir. Is there a significant amount of prep time that the students have to do before they come to class? With Pogel, no. Actually, the opposite. You don't want them doing any prep before they come to class because of the constructivist nature of the method. You want them constructing that knowledge de novo. Then they leave the class and extend what they learned in the class through homework activities. Um, so it's the opposite. Now, in my case-based learning class, I'm dealing with seniors who've had a lot of anatomy, they've had physiology, almost all of them have had microbiology in some form or another, so I have them read the chapters ahead of time so they're familiar with the different bugs, and then they come in and they're working on solving problems and applying what they learned outside of class. So it's kind of flip-flopped. Um, the application phase is all happening in class, the exploration is happening before they get there. So it just depends on the method and what you want them to be doing in the classroom. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. How much emphasis do you place on grading those assessments between the examination? Formative assessments, by definition, are ungraded. Mm -hmm. So I use two types of formative assessment in anatomy and physiology. I use second-to-second, -second, minute to minute formative assessment by looking at what they're actually doing, by having them report out as they're completing the activities. Um, and then after we've done, say, the blood. So we've done all three activities on the blood, there's a quiz. Um, and again, it's formative. It's meant to help them know what they know, do and don't know. So the quiz is ungraded. They can take it unlimited times. Right? The idea there is that they are assessing, they're learning in addition to the material, they're learning self-assessment, which again, I'm teaching them college. Um, and then we do a formative assessment, which is an examination or a lab exam or something like that. So you know, these formative assessments, I'm sorry, we do a summative assessment like an exam. So these formative assessments are, by definition, ungraded. Or, like with the online quizzes, I think they get five points apiece for them, um, which comes out to be like a total whopping 10% of their overall grade. Sometimes it's even less. Um, just to encourage them to do it, but not enough that it can actually make a big difference uh, in their overall grade. If you sink on, you know, if you make a D on all your exams and ace the online quizzes, you're still going to get a D in the class. Anybody else? All right, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it.